Coming up now, ma. Ready now. Yeah. Secretary, please remember to apologize for late starting, for starting a little bit. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Bible study. I hope we all had a great week. Um, I'd like day. to welcome everyone to today's Bible study. I hope we all had a great week. Uh, so um we're sorry for starting a bit late you know sometimes we can't just help this technical stuff but we thank god that we are back online now um i'd like to welcome everyone to today's bible study once again i hope you had a great week a great day so brendan let us begin to thank god for making it possible for you and i to be here today can only be God since the last time we met, that we are meeting again tonight. It is only by His grace. Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. We thank you for another time in your presence to learn at your feet. It can only be you. We thank you that we gather to study your word and not to mourn. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. To be thou exalted in Jesus' name. Um, Brethren, let us commit tonight unto God's hand. Father, we commit tonight unto your hands. We pray, O oh God, that even as we learn at your feet, O oh God, that you will speak to each and every one of us yourself in the name of Jesus. We pray that we are not just going to be hearers of your words, but also doers of your words in the name of Jesus. We pray that everything we'll learn today will not stand against us, but rather will be recorded for us as a reward in the name of Jesus. We pray even as we learn at your feet, our life will be changed, our life will be transformed. And at the end, your name alone will be glorified. Father, even as I teach, I ask for the option, I ask for your grace, and I ask for your mercy, that, Lord, you will speak through me, you will speak through everyone that contributes tonight in the name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. But then for the past few weeks now, we've been um, talking about the parables of Jesus. We've been talking about the parable of Jesus, and we're still on the parables of jesus we've explored the parables of jesus what are the parables of jesus why did jesus speak in parables in the lessons we're told that um the parables we've learned that the parables are earthly stories you know that gives heavenly meaning and that the parables were written in the four gospel which is matthew mark luke and john and that these stories were told to teach spiritual truth. Also, why did we talk? Why did Jesus talk in parables? You know, he spoke in parables to conceal some wisdom in the parables because some of those parables were relatable to people. And also because it could get, you know, a good parable would obviously get the attention of listeners. We're told that the parables, there are about 38 parables in the Bible. And that some of them, you know, were for some of the parables were told for it for a particular time, and some were told for time yet to come. And so today we're going to go into the parables of today, the study of today, and that would be the parables of the laborer in the vineyard. The parable of the laborer in the vineyard, and I'm going to be reading from Matthew. 21 to 16. Matthew 21 to 16, and I read, this will help you understand the way heaven, heaven's kingdom operates. I'm, used, I'm reading from the TPT translation. This will help you understand the way everyone's kingdom operates. There once was a wealthy landowner who went out at, the, at daybreak to hire all the laborers he could find to work in his vineyard. After agreeing to pay them the standard day wage, he put them to work. Then at nine o'clock, as he was passing through the town square, 
he found others standing around without work. Without work, he told them, "Come and work for me in my vineyard, and I will pay you a fair wage." So all so off they went to join the others. He did the same at noon, and again at three o'clock, making the same arrangement as he did with others, open to open to finish his harvest that day. He went to the town square again at five o'clock and found more who were idle. So he said to them, why have you been here all day without work? Because no one hired us, they answered. So he said to them, then go and join my crew and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard went to his foreman and said, call in all laborers, line them up and pay them same wages, starting with the most recent one I hired and finishing with the one who worked all day. When those hired late in the day came to be paid, they were given a full day wage. wage. And when those who had been hired first came to be paid, they were con convinced that they would receive more. But everyone was paid the same wage. When they realized what had happened, they were offended and complained to the landowner, saying, you are treating us unfairly. They have only worked for one hour. While we have labored and sweated all day under the scorching sun, you have made them equal to us. The landowner replied, friends, I am not being unfair. I am doing exactly what I said. Did you agree to work for the standard wage? If I want to give those who only work for an hour equal pay, what does that matter to you? Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Why should my generosity make you jealous of them? Now you can understand what I meant when I said the first will end up last and the last will end up being first. Everyone is invited but few are chosen. Praise the Lord. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. So, in this parable, the parable actually covers the landowner, the vineyard, the workers, um, the believer, and the dinerous, which is the reward. Jesus tells the story of the labor in the vineyard in response to Peter's question in Matthew 19, 27. We have left everything to follow you. What then will be for us? Peter wanted to know what reward will be given to those who give up everything to follow Christ. You know, before the story, before Jesus Christ told the story, in Matthew 19, when... Um, a certain man came to Jesus to ask Jesus, you know, what good can I do to make heaven? And Jesus said, there's no good you can do. Only God is good. He said, okay, what must I do? Jesus said, you need to obey the commandments, all the commandments. He said, but I do that. He said, okay, if you do that, um, sell all your, um, give out all your properties, all that you have, and follow me. And the man was sad and he went away. And Jesus said, it will be hard. It will be easy for a camel to go through the heights of a tread and, and, a man, and a man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And Peter was like, so how then would anyone be saved? You know, and Jesus said something. He said, for, for a man, I'm just going to paraphrase He said, some things might not be possible for a man to do. He said, but with God, anything is possible. A man might not be able to do something or would not be able to do some certain things, but God can do anything. So Peter asked, so we that we have left all that we have, you know, left our businesses, left our families, left everything to follow you. What's our reward? Jesus said, you definitely sit with him at the right hand of the Father. 
you know, in heaven and, you know, and it also promised them eternal life and it told the story. Now, this is a story of the landowner who has a very big vineyard, a very massive one, and there work to be done. He went out to get workers. The first set of workers, he went out very early in the morning, either on either before dawn or at dawn. He went out and he found those workers, workers that were willing to work, you know, that were ready to work. And he put them there and they worked diligently. I'm sure the landowner realized, oh, there's more work to be done, you know, uh, in, in, in the vineyard. And so he went out at 9, 9 a.m., got some other people. So the initial people that he found, he told them, if you're going to work for me, I'm going to pay you this. And they agreed. It's just like when you go out to get a job, you know, obviously they would, you know, there will be um, an agreement of what you would be paid. And so the workers accepted and they went to work. And they got another, he saw some other set of people at 9 a.m., you know, just being idle to come and work. And he told them, come work for me and I will pay you what is right. So they did not have an agreement of what they should be paid. And so they went and they went to work for him on the vineyard. Another set of people at 12, another set at three and another set at five. And they were all working diligently. And it was time for them to be paid. And it started from the last to the first. And where the problem was is the first set of people, you know, that, that started working diligently, tirelessly from morning, even before dawn, they lost their sleep, you know, that early to work. And he's paying them the same amount that he has promised or they have agreed to be paid. The same amount with somebody that worked, let's assume they ended their work at six and he employed the last person at five. The last person was paid, worked for one hour, was paid the same amount with the first group of people, you know, and they were really upset and they were complaining. And the landowner said, you don't need to be upset. We agreed for you to be paid this certain amount of money. So it's my business. How much I pay these other people? I'm not being unfair, I'm not being unjust, but it is what we have agreed. It's my business, you don't need to be jealous. Are you jealous because I'm paying them the same thing I'm paying you? So this story is actually relating to the kingdom of God. You know, it's a story about the kingdom of God and there are several aspects to it. In the kingdom of God, we have a boss and the, our boss is God the Father, the king of the universe. He has his own plans for his kingdom. He has his plans for the church. And you know, whatever his intentions are for his kingdom, for his church, it necessarily does not have to reveal it to us. He can choose to reveal it to us, but he doesn't have to reveal it to us. You know, secondly, the story also points that there's so much work to be done in the kingdom. So much work to be done. I'm going to be reading, I'd read Matthew 9, 35 to 38 for us. Matthew 9, 35 says, Jesus walked throughout the region with the joyful message of the kingdom. With, of, with the joyful message of God's kingdom realm. He taught in the meeting house and wherever he went to demonstrate God's, to demonstrate God's power by healing every kind of diseases and illness. When he saw the vast crowd of people, Jesus' heart was deeply moved with compassion because they seemed weary and helpless like wandering sheep without a shepherd. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is huge and ripe, but there, but there are not enough harvesters to bring, to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner of the harvest to trust out many more reapers to harvest his grain. So another part of the story is telling us that there's so much work to be done in the kingdom of God. The harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. 
Thirdly, you can also say that, you know, for everyone that works in the kingdom of God, there is always a reward. God is not an unjust God. There is always a reward for everyone that work in the kingdom. You know, if we look at the story, the first group of people, you know, they had a sense. We're not we're not going to look at it because a different aspect. We have to look at it in the spiritual aspect, you know, even in the physical, because if you are employed to work somewhere and I've agreed to pay you this, and somebody works for an hour and I decide to pay the person, I'm generous to give the person out whatever I want to give to them. It's my business. So the first group of people felt entitled. You know, because they have worked tirelessly from morning till night, you know, they they woke up so early in the morning to work and they have done all they need to do. You know, they felt entitled. So there are some people in the kingdom, you know, that feel, you know, they feel they are important in the kingdom of God much more than, you know, much more than other people. And they feel that they should earn more. You know, there's some people that feel they're more important in the kingdom of God that will be surprised that that is not how God's grace work. You know, somebody might have given their life to Christ 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. And somebody that will give their life to Christ just a year ago, they're both going to receive the same reward. Now, let's not get it twisted. The reward we're talking about here is eternal life is eternal life. God has promised us eternal life when we come to Christ, giving your life to Christ, accepting him as your Lord and Savior, working in his vineyard. He has promised us eternal life. Just like he has promised a father of faith in those days. So imagine now, in those days, Father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, they are, you know, and then we die, and by God's grace, we're all going to receive the same reward of eternal life. So we are all saved by grace. It is not by our good works. It is not by our good works. So People who comes to Christ later in life, you know, would receive the same reward. Those who have been, who have, who have given their life to Christ years, years ago, you know, you see some people, and that's why we need to be very careful. Because we are in Christ because grace found us. And the same grace that found us will find, you know, other people also. So we shouldn't be jealous. When we shouldn't be jealous when we find somebody that has been, you know, that's done some so has done so much terrible things and that we feel that um, they should be punished. Oh, they should not find no. And you that right from the day they gave birth to you, you have been in Christ. You have not been in the world. You have known Christ. You have found Christ. And somebody who has lived a wayward life all their years. As a matter of fact, an example of the man that was on the cross by Jesus, he was right there, he gave his life to Christ. On the cross, imagine all the atrocity he has committed. You see, that's why God is a very faithful and a loving God. And this is telling us that, you know, we'll, we all should, there's nobody his grace is sufficient for every one of us. And he died and entered heaven. And that's why they always say something that be very careful, be very prayerful, watch and pray so that the enemy does not kill you. Because that enemy that killed you, that you think that will be killed, that will not enter heaven, you'll be surprised that you will find him in heaven. You'll be surprised that you will find him in heaven. So we're, this passage, this Bible is actually talking about eternal life. Of course, in the scriptures, it teaches us that there are different rewards in heaven for different services. But the ultimate reward 
is eternal life. At least you will get to heaven first before you are now given different crowns. We have to get to heaven. You have to get to heaven. The landowner's decision to pay all his workers the same was an act of mercy, not injustice. Mercy and grace found you were neither in Christ Jesus. And the same mercy and grace will find you know, those that are yet to give their life to Christ. It was not, it was not an act of injustice. It's an act of mercy, love, the love he has. And that's why, you know, the Bible says that he wishes above all things. That we should, we should, we should, we should make it to heaven and not perish. And that's why, you know, the Bible also says that Jesus will not come until everybody has heard about him. That's because he's a loving God. He's a just God. So you will not have an excuse that you did not hear about him. After the first group of workers, the other group of workers were fully confident of the landowner's character, that they trusted him at his word. You see, when, Jesus, when, when the landowner went out, the other set of people that he spoke to, he didn't negotiate with them, or he didn't tell them I was going to pay you anything. He just told them, go and work for me, and I will pay you what is right. He gave to them much, much more than they deserved. Much more than they deserve. If, if Christ should decide to pay us what we deserve, you and I will not be here standing. In fact, we will not, only God knows what would have become of us. And that is why we have always been told several times that that spirit of familiarity with God you know, we need to be very careful, especially those of us that have given our life to Christ years, 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 years. If you, you have known all of God, when you have not even known a tiny bit, what you know about God is just a tiny little bit. And that's why we are told that every day we should pray that God should reveal himself in a new way to us. He should reveal himself in a new way to us, in a new dimension. You know, they, they, th those other people, they just, they just trusted him. They trusted his word. I was going to do right. And they went to work. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Just trust him. Trust his word. He has promised us eternal life. He has promised us eternal life. Just give your life to him. Accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. And walk in his vine yard. And just let him. You know, he is God. That's why the landowner said, I can do, you know, I can do it with my money, whatever I want to do is my business. And let's just trust him. And that's what those people do. And you see what came out of it. They went trusting his word that he was going to do right. And they went to work for him diligently. And he gave to them much more than they deserved. And that's what the parable is telling us now. That we need to come to Christ. We need to work in his vineyard. And he will bless us. He will give us much more than we deserve. We don't need to. He knows us. He knows our needs. He knows what we're going through. Even before we open our mouth. All he's just asking for us to do. Is to do his work. Now what is that work? Go ye and preach the gospel. Bring people to Christ. Live a life worthy of him live a life what emulating live a life of christ that people can see you and say this person is truly you know of god a life what emulating wherever you find yourself this is what is telling us trust is what is going to bless you it's going to bless you it is paying them the wages beginning with the last Jesus wants to make about the first being the last and the last being the first. We read that in the Bible passage. So according to this parable, it can be interpreted on the it can be interpreted that all believers, no matter how long or how hard they have worked during their lifetime, will receive the same reward, which is eternal life. No matter how much you've worked, no matter in fact, you're working for God should be out of love for him. 
He has promised us eternal life. He said, no matter how hard, how much you have worked, no matter how much you've worked, he has promised us eternal life. The same way he has promised someone that I've just nearly converted. The same eternal life he has promised us. Also, we can look at it, you know, in another aspect. God wants us to humble ourselves and serve him willingly, not grudgingly. If you're willing to sacrifice and put yourself in the last place, if you're willing to sacrifice, he doesn't want us to serve him grudgingly. If you're willing to sacrifice everything and put yourself in the last place, it will show it will show great mercy and kindness to you. But if you selfishly pursue glory and riches, you will be left holding nothing. So if you put yourself last and put God first, the Bible says, seek first his king, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing will be added unto you. So if you pursue after glory and riches over God, over what God has placed in your hand, you know, over what God has placed in your hand and you feel you want to build a whole house or you want to ride a very big car or you want to do this, neglecting the work of God, the place of God you will eventually be left with nothing. The Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses life? All of those things are heavenly things, but he has promised us eternal life. So if you, if you sacrifice putting yourself last and putting God first, it will, go, it will show you great mercy and kindness. Why did Jesus use this parable? Why did Jesus use this parable? Jesus used this parable to remind them that all their blessings are from God's generosity and not their doing. Everything we receive in life is a gift. God does not bless his children as a repayment for the labor but from his generosity. I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved by faith. Nothing, nothing you did could ever earn the salvation. For it was the love gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast for salvation is never a reward of good works or human striving. So we have not earned salvation by the works of our hand. I know, you know, I had an experience with one of my clients that came and she wanted me to render a service to her on a Sunday morning. And I told her, oh, no, I'll be going to church. And then she said, okay. She booked another day. And then she called me back again, second day. And said, it's not going to work. It's, it's only going to work on that Sunday morning. And I told her, I said, I have to go to church. It's not going to work. I can't. I don't work on Sundays. I go to church and I come back home to rest. And I said, it's not going to work. I have to go to church in the morning. And she said, oh, where she's going to is around one. So blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't. And she's like, what is it about you going to church? Going, can't you pray in your house? You're going to work. I said, well, I have to go to church. The Bible says we should not forsake the garden of the people. It's not like I can't pray in the house. There's a reason why we have to go to church. And she was like, I should save her all of that. I said, ah, don't you go to church? She said, no, she doesn't go to church. I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes. And then she was like, all oh, these church people, pastors, and all of that, she was saying a lot, you know. And I'm like, you need to be careful. You must, even if you have had, you know, an issue with a pastor or something, you don't generalize. You need to say, no, 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 she leave that. Now, even the work she does alone on the last day, so many pastors, so many people will not enter. The work she does alone. And I said, I said, no. I said, you are not saved by the work, by the works of your hands. I said, your righteousness is of God. It's not your own righteousness. I said, your righteousness might not take you anywhere. God might not even accept it. So she kept quiet. And then she said, I should not worry. She just leave all, the, all of that. 
And I'm like, so people still think this way, thinking that they can actually earn, you know, eternal life by good works. So this is telling us that we can't earn any of that. You know, we all know this other faith. I believe that when they do good, when they do all of that, yes, we give them. Yes, the Bible has, you know, has commanded us, you know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that yes, it's there. But we cannot earn it. And as a matter of fact, for us to even obey that law, we need the grace of God. We need God. You know, and that is why when I read about Matthew 19, that Matthew 19, before the um, parables that we're saying today, Matthew 19, when Peter was asking, so who, when Jesus said, uh, when Jesus said, a camel, it would be easy for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than, you know, we human. But Jesus told him something. He said, anything is not possible for a man, but everything is possible with God. That's to tell us that it's going to be hard, but we need to rely on God. Even those good works, we need the grace of God. Why? Because we are human. Our flesh fails us on several occasions. If God is going to treat us, like I said before, what we deserve, you and I, the good works we do, will not be able to cover up for the, for the wrong what we do, how we hurt God every day. So Jesus Christ is telling them, just like those four set of workers, thinking that they are entitled, oh, we have worked tirelessly all day. You need to pay us more. No. Salvation is a gift. Everything we receive in life is a gift. Our life, the hell we breathe in. Yes, the Bible says, see a man diligent in his work, he will stand before mere men and uh, before kings and not mere men. Yes. But do you know that this work that, we, that you're talking about, some people do that work and they are still suffering. The same work. And they're also diligent, just like you. So that is to tell you that we cannot achieve anything without God. So everything we have is a gift from God. It is not because we are diligent. It is not because we are righteous. It is not because we are better than anybody. The moment we realize that everything we have is a gift from God, then the, the moment we realize that then we are able to surrender to him completely, for him to take the will of our life, take control, Father. You know, while you're trying to do those things you're doing, you're submitting everything to God, laying everything at his feet. I can't do anything of my own self. I have no, you know, I have no power of my own. So this is reminding us that every of our blessings are from God's generosity, not our own doing. Not because you go to church every Sunday, not because you study your Bible every Sunday, or uh, sorry, every day. No. For you to do all of that things, you need his grace. You need his help because the devil is also there by your side. So the moment you neglect God, the devil comes in. God does not bless his children as a repayment for their labor, for his generosity, like we said. If God gives us what we deserve, you and I will not be where we are today. Why did Jesus use this parable it's never too late to come into his kingdom even those who are converted late in life earn equal reward along with those converted early i'm going to read joel 2 12 Joel to 12. That is why the Lord says, Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your heart. Come with fasting, weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your heart instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to hunger, 
and filled with unfailing love, he is eager to relent and not punish. I want to read another version. Yeah, sure, read. It says, I'm going to read, um, what version is this? Contemporary English version. It says, the Lord said, it's not too late. You can still return to me with all your heart. Start crying and mourning. Go without eating. Don't rip your clothes to show your sorrow. Instead, turn back to me with broken heart. I am merciful, kind, and caring. I don't easily lose my temper, and I don't like to punish. So this is telling us that no matter how far we might have gone, our, gone with our sin, it's never too late for us to come back. It's never too late. Just like the example of the man with, you know, that I said on, that was, you know, on the cross that was crucified when Jesus was crucified. Just like that man also, he was at the point of death. He gave his life to Christ, regardless of how he has lived his life. You know, at that point, he gave his life and is going to receive that reward of eternal life. So even those that convert life, will, you know, they will receive equal reward. So don't be tough on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. It's never too late. The door is always open. And that's why Jesus has not come, because it's never too late. That's why he's still waiting for that person, you know, to give their life to Christ. Why did Jesus use this parable? To make us know that salvation is not earned. Eternal life is a gift that God gives purely by grace according to his sovereign will. It's a gift. Like we said, everything that we have is a gift from God. Salvation is not earned. I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I think I read that before. It says, you were saved by faith in God. Who, who treats us much better than we deserve? This is God's gift to you and not anything you have done on your own. It isn't something you have earned, so there is nothing you can, you can brag about it. You know, a lot of us, we, because we have found Christ, because of that grace, you know, Mercy found us. God's grace found us. And then we look at people. You know, that's why I love my pastor. There was a time, where I, I can't remember the topic we were teaching. And I talked about something a friend told me, you know. And while I was saying the story about a lady, you know, she, she everybody knows her. She's in church. She's a chorister or something. She works diligently in church, you know. That's what people know. And at a particular time, they saw her in the club in the night, you know, she's married, the club dancing provocatively with another man. And, you know, while I was talking, he corrected me and said, I'm not in a place. And that's one thing he would always say, you do not judge. Rather, pray for that person because the same grace that found you, pray that that same grace will find that person. Pray that that same grace, if grace has not found us, imagine how terrible, terrible you and I would have been. So that same grace that has found us, we're not in the place to condemn other people. We're not in the place to look at them like, you know, but rather it should be a burden in our heart to pray that that same grace that has found us should find, you know, find them. It should not be like a set of workers that were jealous like, how can you give us the same thing? We deserve more. I've been working here for, you know, for, 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 for hours. For hours. Why did Jesus use this parable? Telling us that there is work to be done in his kingdom. Like we read before, Matthew 35, 38, that the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. You and I, that are in Christ and those that are yet to come to Christ are to be doing the work. This is our job as believers. If someone is willing, someone is a willing worker, you will find plenty to do and will be fairly rewarded for the work 
they have done. This is do. If someone is willing, if someone is a willing worker, he will find plenty to do and will be fairly rewarded for the work that they have, that they do. God will pay everyone. You know, there's a part in the Bible that says that every of our work will be tested with fire. But at least we need to, first of all, you know, enter, gain eternal life before they begin to test all our work to know how many crown will be given to you, how many crown will be given to you, how many crown will be given to you. But surely we will be rewarded fairly because our God is a just God. He's not an unjust God. Why did Jesus use this parable? He says, I will pay you what is right. It is God's decision to decide how to deal with his worker. He can give more or less according to his own choice when he determines what is right or wrong. He is sovereign. He is God. Why a clay in, the, in Potter's hand, he decides what is wrong, what is right. You see, that my customer that was telling me that I do this, I do that, I do that. And because of that, I will be surprised. She will first, she will first of all enter. That's how she was so she was confidently saying it. It's God that will decide if that good you're doing, the intent of your heart is what matters. If that good you are doing, even if you like, build 100 churches. It's God to, that will decide if you enter heaven. You will build 100 churches and then you'll be living a life opposite Christ. or not giving your life to Christ. And you think that your good works will make, give you, make you go, go to heaven. Or just like this, our people that will believe moral in, in, in you know moral life, doing things the right way and believe that I don't need to go to church. I don't need to give my life to Christ. No. It's God that will decide what is right and what is wrong. Because why? He's sovereign. And then we're going to go for the lesson of the parable. Lesson of the parable. Lesson of the parable. God treats people well, not because they have earned it, but because He is a loving God who treats people better than they deserve. God does not show favoritism. God does not show favoritism. Romans 2:11. Roman 2 verse. 11. God does not have any favorite. God is not a partial God. God treats people well, not because they have earned it, but because he is a loving God. He is a good God. And in response to that marvelous grace, God wants us as people to treat others the same way he treats us, which is with love and acceptance. Which is not judging them, but treat other people with love and acceptance. All who choose to dedicate their life to him will receive the promised reward, which is eternal life regardless of when they may have begun to work the covenant part. The moment you dedicate your life to him, you receive the promise of eternal life. The moment you confess, accept him as your Lord and Savior, dedicate your life to him, regardless of whenever you give your life to Christ, this, you, know, you will receive the eternal life. God gives the same abundant grace to everyone who follows Christ. E.g. the tax collector, the harlot. We remember the story of the harlot. When she was coming, everybody was throwing his stone. And Jesus said, and they were telling Jesus to, you know, to, to, to also, you know. And Jesus said, okay, if you are, if there's anyone here without sin, throw the first stone. And they all started going, you know, going. And Jesus told the lady, he said, go and sin no more. You are forgiven. Where are your accusers? So the same abundant grace is sufficient, is available for everyone who follows Christ. The grace is sufficient. The 
the tax collector, the harlot, the beggars, the blind, will share in the same eternal life as those who have served God all their life and those who have preached the gospels to thousands, the same reward, which is eternal life, will all receive. We should all strive to be like God. We should also have a reputation for dealing with others honestly. Colossians 4. Slave owner, be fair and honest with your slaves. Don't forget that you have a master in heaven, especially, you know, we, the, the Christian employers. We need to treat other people fairly, honestly. The landowner, just by the fact that he employed them, you know, at a, at a time, imagine the one and hour to when they were going to finish work. He treated them honestly and fairly, even much more than they deserve. So this is telling us that we need to, you know, strive to be like God, ask for the grace to be like him. We're a mirror that everyone is looking at as children of God. There's always a need for more workers in the kingdom. There's always a need. As we know, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Say Matthew 9, 35 to 39. Harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Are you actively praying? Matthew 9, 38 says we should pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers and ready to train more workers. Are you actively praying and ready to train more workers? That's a question for everyone. As children of God, we shouldn't be idle in the kingdom. The landowner asks, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? The, landowner quest, the landowner's question is a kind of rebuke. You know, why are you idle? Why are you just there standing? I mean, you could actually go around, go to different vineyards and ask if there's anything you can do. Rather than st staying idle. So this is telling us that those of us in church, you know, those of us that have given our life to Christ, there's a lot to do. There is a lot to do. We shouldn't be idle. We have not just been called, you know, just to give our life to Christ. And that's why they say that when you give your life to Christ, why didn't Jesus just take you away like that? If you've given your life to Christ, yeah, come on, come. So you make heaven. No, there's a reason why he has left every one of us here on earth. There's so much work to be done. We don't have to be idle as children of God. Do we have any question if I go further to the conclusion? Do we have any question? Maybe a great of this. Maybe I should maybe I should try a question then before the conclusion. Why does the landowner go to find more workers? Why does the landowner go to find more workers? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, uh, earlier Kitty, you have said the landowner is, you know, God Almighty. And, you know, he's going to find more workers because he's not interested in the death of a sinner. He wants as many people as possible to, to be saved, to come into his kingdom. And it doesn't matter when you receive him, whether from the day you are born, whether you're born into the faith or you converted into the faith, or that you've lived a reckless life all your life, it doesn't matter. For as long as there is time, he's going to keep looking for workers to come into his vineyard. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So another one, what does this teach us about the kingdom of God? 
What does this teach us about the kingdom of God? Uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But I think this teaches us to hold fast to the end. Don't feel because you've been there for a long time, you can while away time or do the way you like. So it's not uh, who started, but it's who who ends who ends who ends it. Because the landowner decides how to compensate. It's not your decision. It's his decision. So if you feel okay, I want to because I've been there for too long. I want more. It's not your decision to say you want more. But it's his decision to pay you and to give you according to his own grace, according to some what you feel he wants to give to each one of you. So just keep working on, just keep doing your part and focus on what the landowner wants you to do. That is God Almighty now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going further to the conclusion. Number one, we need to put our faith in God. He has our good at heart. We need to put our faith in him. He has our good at heart. You know, he deals with us mercifully. Sometimes, you know, we don't see or understand God's what we don't we don't seem to understand God's design. We don't seem to understand what God is doing. We face so many trials, we go through a lot of things. But we put our faith in God. And those that's what all those other workers did. They trusted his word and they just went, you know, went ahead to keep doing the things that you know that they were doing doing the work of god not even knowing how much they will be paid so we need to trust him we need to put our faith in him number two be thankful for god's mercy be thankful for god's mercy you know is the mercy of god if the landowner was merciful to all those other workers and that's why he gave them much more than they can they deserve. We need to be thankful for his mercy, for his love, for his grace, for the gift of salvation. We should not be jealous of others when God shows them mercy. Rather, we should rejoice with those who rejoice. We should not be jealous of them. How God deals with everybody at different level is different. But rather, we should rejoice with them. Because those first set of workers were jealous of those other people. Because they've agreed how much they will be paid anyways. So if the landowner decides to pay them more, it's his choice. They were envious of them. It was an act of envy. So we need to rejoice, you know, with those that rejo uh, rejoice in. We need to be willing to work and diligent we need to be willing to work and be diligent you know those those workers the the the, the workers that came in earlier the first set of workers you know they left their bed instead of them sleeping they woke up early and you know they were willing to work they worked diligently so we need to be diligent we need to be willing to work and be diligent with our work we don't need men's approval. We need God's approval. We need God's approval. And I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I pray that all our work will not be in vain on earth. And every reward, every of our reward will not be in vain. At the end of our every everything we do on earth, we will not miss the ultimate reward, which is eternal life. Mm -hmm. and grace for Amen. all to hold on till the hand the Lord will give unto us. Amen. No fail, we will not falter. Amen. In oh. Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Oh. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do we have any conclusion, any subtraction, any, any more question? If you're online and you have questions, I know I was just talking and talking and talking and talking. Um, any question, any contribution, you can actually put it on our social media handle and we'll always get back to you. You know, we are all learning together. If there's something you don't understand or you're not comfortable with, it's okay for you to put it up. We're all learning together. And I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the absence of none, in the absence of none, can we go to God and begin to thank him for the opportunity you know, that he has given us tonight to, to learn at his feet. Father, we thank you, you know, once again. 
you know, for teaching us tonight in your own way. We thank you that every word, you know, that you have spoken to us tonight will not fall to the ground. We pray that we are not just going to be heirs of your word. We pray, oh God, that we are going to be doers of your word in the name of Jesus. We pray, oh God, for those that are yet to give their life to Christ. We pray, oh God, that you will minister to them yourself in the name of Jesus. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. We share the grace and fellowship. The love of God. And the spirit of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Rest, Rest and abide in us now and forever. Amen. Amen. Surely, God's goodness God and mercy shall follow us all, all the days, days of my life. life. And, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and, and ever. ever. Amen. 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 So, do not everyone we'll see you again Amen. next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have been blessed by today's ministration. For more materials from Jesus Pavilion UK, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Jesus Pavilion UK TV. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Jesus Pavilion UK. God bless you as you continue to seek the truth and grow in grace.